All right, hello everyone. Uh, it's 3.05, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining. My name is Will Steinberger. I'm a PhD student at the University of Michigan, and today I'm going to be talking about setting up your detector. So it was brought to my attention that, uh, go to the next slide, there we go, that this is really an open-ended question of setting up your detector. So I'm going to apply some constraints to that uh, statement real quick. And then specifically, we're going to focus on some key points. So the first uh, constraint is that we're going to focus on scintillator-based detectors. And we're also going to assume that we can uh, fully uh, adjust our scintillator detector such that we control the wrapping, we control the coupling, we control what we couple it to, the environment that it's placed, and then finally we're going to end up uh, with voltage and how do we determine an optimized voltage. So scintillator, reflector, and coupling, these two things matter significantly for light collection efficiency. We have to be able to collect all the light that is emitted from the scintillator, which is directly going to impact our energy resolution and total light output. As we'll see also, this affects our pulse shape too, which will impact our timing resolution or timing applications. We're also going to talk a little bit about background radiation and room return. Specifically, something that we've run into is the internal radioactivity of some scintillators that uh, we'd like to bring to your attention and we'd like to discuss briefly. And then finally, we're going to talk about uh, voltage optimization and how you should go about choosing an applied voltage for your system, whether you are optimizing in terms of energy resolution or there are dynamic range considerations. Um, as always, please feel free to uh, put questions into the chat, and at the end of the lecture, I will be happy to go through those. But let's get started. So first of all, we're going to start talking about reflections, or first of all, talking about reflections and then uh, how we collect this light. So as a brief overview, ionizing radiation comes in, interacts with our scintillator. That uh, generally produces a recoiled charged particle. That recoiled charged particle moves through uh, our scintillator and excites either the lattice or excites um, molecules that then de-excite and emit light. Um, that light is emitted isotropically um, and is generally reflected within the uh, scintillator and eventually uh, is absorbed by our photocathode. Uh, for this, it can have several mechanisms of reflection, but generally uh, we can't necessarily assume that the light is going to be directly emitted towards our uh, photo towards our photocathode, uh, such that we want to have some kind of reflector around our uh, scintillator to be able to direct that light into it such that we can easily collect it. Um, so what are some types of reflectors? And the first one, um, that I'm going to talk about is if we actually do not have a reflector, uh, because this does pay, play a major role, and this is total internal reflection. So this occurs when we have, if we look at this plot or this figure on the right here, when we have two different mediums where we have a lower and higher index of refraction between the two, such that if we have light, let's say produced in a scintillator that has a higher index of refraction, and then air that has a lower index of refraction, at some point we will get um, light that will be able to escape with some angle, um, but will eventually hit a critical angle. Uh, this critical angle is based off of the, we can see here, the uh, ratio of the arc sine of the two index indices of refraction. And eventually, once we go below that angle for, or yeah, once we go past that angle, we will get a total reflection. And this will act as a specular reflector and we will not lose that light. Um, and we can see uh, here, I've just detailed a, an example of one of these uh, measurements that we've performed, where in this case, we're looking at maximizing total internal reflection by just having a bare scintillator coupled to a silicon photomultiplier here. And we'll see uh, some of the properties of this in just a moment, uh, because it might might be wondering, why would we want to do this? In this case, we're losing significant portions of light, that significant portions of information carriers that uh, generally help us statistics wise and be able to gain more information. But we'll uh, talk about that in just a minute. 
Two other types of reflection that are more common and uh, not more common, but are generally used for uh, scintillators are taking into account specular reflection and then diffuse reflection. So specular reflection, just like what was showed on the uh, previous slide, when we go past that critical angle, is when the incident light scatters at the same uh, angle as the reflected light. And you can see that is the law of reflection that is a mirroring here. Um, and we, this comes up with mirrors, it comes up in a lot of things. Uh, example of specular reflection, uh, seeing this bounce off of the water there that we get that mirror image of it. Um, and the angle of the light is not changed. Uh, another type of reflection that we take into account is diffuse reflection. So in terms of specular reflection, we have the incoming photon go off and scatter at its incident angle. Um, However, with um, diffuse reflection, there is some probability that that photon can scatter at any additional angle um, with this medium. And the idea behind this is that you have a non-polished or, non or a rough surface such that the incoming photon uh, basically can interact with any like sub facet effectively of the surface and scatter at any angle, which is why, um, for instance, uh, if this uh, water was not stable and uh, clear, but it was very rough, very choppy, you would get more of a diffuse reflection where you won't be able to make out that image. So what are some common types of reflectors that are used for these applications? So diffuse reflectors, um, one of the most common ones is Teflon tape, uh, PTFE. Uh, this is generally used for uh, pipes, things of that nature, um, uh, when uh, putting things together, but it works as a fantastic reflector. And we're going to show some data uh, to back up that statement in just a moment, but uh, that works great and is very common that you'll find within uh, nuclear instrumentation. There are, of course, reflective paints. Um, EJ510 from Elgin is a reflective paint that we've used with that I believe actually contains aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide is also a very common uh, diffuse reflector. So generally, uh, when especially purchasing inorganic scintillators, they will at the very least, if they're not already coupled to a photomultiplier tube or a silicon photomultiplier, they will come in their own housing. And you can see an illustration of a basic package scintillator here, where you have an optical window that is generally coupled to the photomultiplier tube. You have some optical medium uh, coupling the scintillator to the window. And then we can see that we have this reflector uh, between the scintillator and its housing. Generally, this reflector is aluminum oxide um, that you'll see uh, purchases from Elgin, from um, St. Gobain, companies of that nature will have an aluminum oxide layer between this and it works very well um, for uh, diffuse reflection and eventually light collection. In terms of specular reflectors, uh, Mylar uh, space blankets um, is used and actually works fairly well. Uh, and then you can absolutely get into more complicated specular reflectors um, that are specifically designed mirror surfaces. So here, 3M SFP D50F. Um, I have linked the product description here if you are interested uh, to learn more about it. But it is a very good uh, specular and mirrored reflector that can be used for these purposes. And just as an illustration here, uh, we have built uh, these types of housings before to put over uh, various organic scintillators. And in this case, we were actually testing the light collection efficiency between a cone and a cylinder to see if we can perform some optimization there in the actual shape of the scintillators while keeping, in this case, the reflector constant. So. Reflector applications. The first one I'm going to talk about is signal to noise. So now that we've talked about uh, the various types of reflection, how does this actually impact our measurement for consideration? So the first thing we need to look at is just what is our signal out and how does uh, that compare if we were to use other uh, 
reflectors or things of that nature. So in this case, I've shown this experimental setup on the previous slide, but I have it here again just for reference, where we have our bare, this is a still bean scintillator coupled to a silicon photomultiplier. And we are in this plot measuring a cesium-137 source with this. So cesium-137 emits um, a 662 keV gamma ray uh, that will come in and primarily Compton scatter in our still bean. Um, and from that Compton scattering, we will get a continuum down to some endpoint, which is the Compton edge of this. And we can clearly see here, since uh, we're keeping our experimental setup uh, constant in this case, all we are doing is changing the reflector here, that as we go from no reflector to a specular reflector, and then up to a a diffuse reflector, in this case Teflon, we're getting significant changes in our light output. We're for, um, so in this case, this is just the pulse height, which is uh, related to the total light output where we're almost getting a doubling factor just by putting on this reflector. And for the Mylar and the uh, DF50 reflector, we are getting some more. And then we can actually see here that the 3M uh, D50 reflector does behave uh, better than the Mylar in this case. Now, what we can do is we can figure out what is the exact value of these Compton edges, and then we can compare these to some kind of noise to give us a signal to noise ratio. And uh, one of the common things that is done for this, um, since we do not obtain photo peaks and thus cannot uh, easily determine energy resolution uh, with organic scintillators is we look at the root mean square or the standard deviation of the uh, baseline before the rising edge of the pulse. And averaging uh, that uh, root mean square or standard deviation of that area gives us an idea of the electronic noise inherent to our system due to our applied voltage. So we'll show that later that that, change, that does change as a function of voltage and is, consideration, and is a consideration, but we can assume that that's being held constant for this case and that this change in average signal to noise ratio is due to us acquiring more light and we're acquiring more light because it's actually being reflected down. Now, one thing to notice here is that um, might be asking, why does the Teflon actually acquire more light, I'll go back to this slide, than the uh, Mylar or the DF50 reflector, than the specular reflection? And the reason is you're not going to get uh, significant angle changes with the Mylar or the DF50 reflector, such that there's only so much light that can act, that is actually at an angle that can then be uh, collected by the uh, photo detector. Versus with the Teflon, because every time it scatters off of the reflector, it can be uh, scattered at some other angle. That means the angle is constantly changing such that eventually it will uh, be at an angle that can be absorbed by the photo detector. Um, one thing to note here, uh, and this is uh, very true with organic scintillators, is that the internal um, attenuation of photons with organic scintillators is uh, very low, such that um, you can have very large organic scintillators and you will not have significant light loss across the organic scintillator. This is not so for inorganic scintillators. So that's something to just keep in mind here. Now, how does this affect other properties? And one of the other properties we uh, mentioned and we care deeply about is timing performance. So in the measurement that you previously saw, instead of using a cesium source, we use a sodium-22 source to measure this. Sodium-22 is a positron emitter. So that positron, uh, it decays from sodium-22, uh, then uh, interacts with an electron, annihilates, and produces two 511 keV photons that are emitted at 180 degrees from each other, such that we can put a detector on both sides of a sodium-22 source, look for coincident events, and then uh, look at the relative difference between coincident events. And because our system is so small, uh, in this case, relative to the uh, time for the speed of light, we can assume that uh, any spread in our distribution is due to the response of our scintillator and our um, 
photo detector. And that's exactly what we're looking at here. So uh, we can see this time difference between those two 511 keV photons for in, in this experimental setup for those uh, various reflectors. And this is uh, very interesting in that we can see that in this case, the Teflon, uh, if we look at the full at that half max of this distribution, uh, behaves significantly worse than the other three in this case versus so we get about a one and a half or 1.6 nanosecond standard D or standard uh, full width at half max time resolution uh, for this scintillator wrapped in Teflon versus that goes down by um, about half a nanosecond roughly uh, for the DF50 and for the mylar that are both um, within uncertainty of each other. We can even see that with no reflector that uh, our timing performance behaves better than with our Teflon. And what's happening here um, is that uh, when uh, interactions occur within the uh, DF50 mylar specular or no reflector, that all of the light that can make it uh, to the photo detector in minimal scatters is being collected um, almost immediately for it. And you don't get um, a significant amount of additional light onto that versus uh, with the Teflon, uh, any light that interacts with the edges can be uh, scattered at some other angle. So you're collecting that light over a longer time period than with the DF50 and with the Mylar. So um, what's then happening is that we're getting more statistics in the rising edges of our pulses using the DF50 and the Mylar as opposed to the Teflon and no reflector in this case, um, such that uh, we have better certainty in the rising edges for the timing pickoff and thus better time resolution in this case. So just something interesting, something to consider when setting up your measurement or your applications. Um, two problems that I want to discuss when uh, working with reflectors that are of, uh, that can be of significant consequence. So the first one is simply not putting enough reflector on your scintillator. So here is, uh, I believe this is EJ200 um, that we've coded in uh, the uh, reflective paint in this case. Um, and one of the things you can see is we have a UV light. We have this area that is open, that is unreflected, uh, such that we can couple it to a photomultiplier tube. And we have the rest of it covered. Now, any light that we can see from these angles around it means that there is some non-negligible prob negligible probability that that light can escape. And if that light escapes, that means that's information carriers that we're losing that aren't being acquired that will negatively impact our um, energy resolution, potentially our timing performance, things of that nature. So one thing that is very important with this is to ensure that the, there is an adequate reflector around these scintillators, um, especially with uh, Teflon wrapping, ensuring that it is wrapped enough um, is uh, significant. And especially when purchasing instrumentation and things of that nature, uh, do not be scared to talk to the supplier and ensure that you get details on what the reflector is and if they've performed any optimization with the reflector. Uh, you will find out uh, surprisingly that most companies do not do that and you do have to specifically request it. So just something to keep in mind there. Uh, something else to note um, is that your reflectors can degrade over time, especially if they are not encased and are open to the environment. So I mentioned that Teflon is very commonly used and it acts as a fantastic reflector as we just saw from the previous data. However, Teflon can degrade. So here we have a previously wrapped uh, Teflon sample, two previously wrapped Teflon samples compared to a brand new Teflon sample. And you can physically see that we can see through portions of this Teflon versus the new Teflon we cannot uh, see through at all. And this matters significantly because it's changing your light output collection efficiency. It's changing your detector performance such that any calibration you've previously taken that you want to apply to the system may not actually apply. And this can cause all kinds of issues down the road. So two things to think about uh, here and to some extent, uh, how you would go about mitigating environmental impacts on your system. 
So next, now that we uh, have our scintillator, we have that wrap, we've got a good reflector on it, and we know our application for it, whether we care about uh, just complete signal, energy resolution, or timing properties, how do we actually get it coupled to the uh, photomultiplier tube or the silicon photomultiplier? So generally, PMTs and PsiPMs have a quartz or glass window that we couple them to. And if you just take it and stick it right on there, you're going to probably get an air gap between the scintillator and the window, which can cause uh, that reflection uh, that we don't necessarily want. So one thing we do to match the indices of refraction between the scintillator and our uh, photo detector is to put some type of coupling interface. Generally, um, you'll see that optical grease is very commonly used, and I have uh, references from Elgin here for both um, because these are very commonly used. Elgin 550 um, for the optical grease and then Elgin 560 for optical pads. Now the question becomes, well, why would I want to use optical grease versus an optical pad? So some quick comparisons here. Uh, I've listed the transmission as a function of wavelength for both of these materials. Uh, and we can see that uh, with the optical transmission for 0 0.1 millimeters, very thin amount of optical grease, really don't need a lot of it, we can see that we get near 100% um, efficiency or transmission uh, through this. Uh, especially in the blue region that we really care about. Uh, 420, 425 is where a lot of these scintillators peak, uh, still being uh, peaks closer to about 380 nanometers. Uh, so we want this to have very high transmission efficiency such that we're not losing photons due to our coupling technique here. Um, with the optical interfaces or optical pads, we can see that it's about 10% uh, transmission loss, that it is significantly uh, lesser. However, one of the nice things about the optical pads is that they do act as a cushion and give. So if you are having a detector that can be jostled around, that can be moved, or that um, you want uh, to have a constant pressure for it to be coupled to your photo detector and you don't want that to necessarily damage the photo detector, optical pads and optical interfaces uh, can be a very good choice for that use. So uh, next thing I'm going to talk about is uh, making a light tight system. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, many uh, scintillators that are purchased, um, you will already get them in their detector housing, things of that nature, where you can see this is an EJ309 liquid organic scintillator detector down here, where we have a three inch uh, cylinder of EJ309 liquid organic scintillator coupled to a photomultiplier tube. And you can see that this is rather robustly coupled. And that's very good where they have figured out a particular way of coupling this and getting it to work properly and function properly. Um, this type of uh, detector, however, is not uh, very conducive for uh, relative changes. If we want to take out EJ309 and couple a different scintillator to it, that doesn't really work out well. So generally what we'll have is just open detectors here. So this is a one inch Hamamatsu uh, 10580 photomultiplier tube that we've coupled a uh, six millimeter cylinder of cerium bromide to. Um, and we can see that in this case, the cerium bromide does not occupy up the entire space. It's much smaller. And we can see the photocathode surrounding this. Now, if we were to energize this photomultiplier tube in open light where this picture is taken, uh, that would probably kill the photomultiplier tube. The just, it's too much light. It's going to overwhelm the system and it can damage it uh, significantly. So what we need to do is put it in some kind of light tight housing. And one of the simplest things we do for this is we uh, literally wrap it in a combination of Teflon and electrical tape such that you can see here where it's the same photomultiplier tube that we've just wrapped in this tape to ensure a light tight seal with it. And this is very convenient to be able to do um, to uh, get our detector working and thus to run many different tests or different um, combinations of scintillators coupled to it. Of course, uh, with this is a small detector and this works well, but you can also have larger applications. And for this, it is uh, very common to use what is known as a dark box. 
So all the dark boxes is a uh, box or some kind of system that blocks out all ambient light or light sources. Um, dark boxes can be purchased or made um, depending on the application. So in this case, a student was testing the response of five inch photomultiplier tubes. So relatively large photomultiplier tubes and was uh, switching out uh, huge combinations of scintillators. And in this case, did not want to uh, couple a scintillator, completely wrap it, and have to unwrap it and rewrap it for each case, and just wanted to make life uh, easier to go in, couple, recouple it. And so what they actually did was this is, and to give you an idea of the ingenuity of uh, how this can be made, and that it doesn't have to be anything that grand. Uh, this was a dog cage uh, wrapped in um, uh, blackout light curtains. And we did a, a very thorough job to ensure that we got overlapping and seals with this and everything. And you can actually see the setup where we have the five inch photomultiplier tube. And in this case, we were doing a backscatter experiment, um, looking at the energy resolution response of these types of, uh, of organic scintillators coupled to these large detectors. Um, and this ended up working out very well, but it gave us the opportunity to have an exposed uh, photocathode on this photomultiplier tube and to be able to easily go in and trade out uh, these types of scintillators. Um, the next consideration um, that I'm going to discuss when uh, talking about uh, setting up a detector is uh, backscatter and room return. Um, so generally, uh, when we talk about backscatter, we're talking about uh, photons interacting with the environment and then interacting with our detector. So here, um, as an illustration, I have uh, the same measured cesium-137 spectrum using a cerium bromide uh, scintillator, where we can see this is our backscatter peak. So what happens is the 662 keV gamma ray emitted by cesium will go and scatter in the surrounding environment. So in this case, the aluminum table, the floor, any of the steel supports, things of that nature will scatter in that material and then backscatter into our detector, um, which gives us this peak here right around 200 keV. Uh, generally, you will always see this um, with detectors, especially if you are in some kind of laboratory environment, things of that nature, where you have a lot of scattering materials. Um, something to consider when building or setting up a detector is to minimize uh, those scattering materials. So for instance, um, in our laboratory setups, we try to use um, as much aluminum as possible relative to steel. And even the amount of aluminum we use, we try to minimize it. So making sure that sheets are um, as thin as we can have them, making sure that supports are as limited as possible such that we can mitigate these uh, uh, backscatter events, which can cause, um, if you have a sufficiently large detector, you can have multiple scattering events um, that can give you, uh, that can blur your spectra, things of that nature. It can also contribute to pile up. It can also contribute to um, how sensitive you are to lower energy gamma rays if you also have higher energy gamma ray sources present, things of that nature. So something to consider with that. Um, with room return, room return is generally uh, talking about neutrons specifically, where you have a fissioning source that uh, gives off neutrons, um, not isotropically, but uh, generally in uh, opposite directions. And those neutrons can be emitted towards any surrounding environment or materials. So if we have an experimental time of flight set up here, where we're using one of our detectors to tag fission events, and we're looking at the neutrons interacting with our detectors in this, this is another example of a dark box here, um, those neutrons can actually scatter off the table and into our detector. They can scatter off the floor. They can scatter off of surrounding material, things of that nature. You notice that we have uh, these systems raised off the table somewhat, and this is to try to help mitigate that uh, neutron scattering and then into our system. Since um, if we can just uh, decrease the solid angle for those neutron scattering interactions, we're going to decrease the probability that they make it to our system. 
And we can see when we take the time difference between fission events and neutrons scattering in our system, we get what is called a time of flight distribution. In this case, for a still beam detector. And uh, in the light output lecture, we are going to talk significantly about shadow bar measurements and things of that nature. But for um, the purpose of this uh, discussion, uh, we're going to focus here on this still being time of flight shadow bar um, measurement. And what this is showing is what we do in a shadow bar measurement is block the pathway for fission neutrons to reach our detector. So we're only looking at neutrons that scatter in the environment and then scatter to our detector. And we can see here that especially at larger time differences, since neutrons are not moving relativistically, it takes them a significant time to interact with the environment and then scatter back into our detector. We can see that these are generally longer time frames than the neutrons that are directly from fission for our system but that these do make up a significant contribution to the total number of neutrons that we're seeing. So this is um, very common to see with neutron detectors in that uh, you will get significant scattering from materials that are around them. Um, in even fast neutron detectors, this is um, something to consider and something to uh, think about uh, since uh, many materials are not that are surrounding uh, a neutron source are not necessarily um, very low Z. And if you have high Z materials surrounding um, uh, sources, those neutrons are not going to significantly moderate such that uh, if they do scatter off of those system, they can still have sufficient energies to come in and scatter into your system and be detected, which is what we're seeing here. So generally the point of this is to be very aware of the amount of materials and the types of materials that are surrounding your detector and your systems since they can give significant contributions uh, to what you're trying to measure. Um, the other thing to consider is the type of scintillators. Um, so one of the uh, up and coming and very interesting scintillator uh, that is being used and looked at is lanthanum bromide. Um, lanthanum bromide is a very high light output scintillator and I believe they have it down to about two to three percent energy resolution. So for in terms of um, scintillator applications that is uh, very good. However, one of the drawbacks to it um, is that it has internal radioactivity. So lanthanum-138, you can see, has this decay chain here where we have the emissions of uh, beta particles and we have the emissions of ga two gamma rays. And we can see over in this plot, if we just look at the uh, continuum from this internal decay, um, we can see that this gives a very non-negligible contribution to our background radiation in that you have a beta continuum at low energies um, with a combination up to the 789 keV gamma ray all the way up to a 1436 keV gamma ray. Um, this makes this detector, while it has very good energy resolution, I believe it has a density of greater than five grams per centimeter cube, which, and it's high Z relatively, such that it's very good stopping power, it's very good for gamma ray detection, it does have this internal radioactivity that needs to be taken into account and that needs to be constantly monitored um, to be able to accurately acquire uh, spectra and look for sources. Um, one of the other things to note is that detectors tend to be relatively uh, temperature sensitive. So uh, one of the things that uh, lanthanum bromide is used for in that uh, this is a nice feature in it is that you can actually uh, do calibration from internal radioactivity and ensure that you don't have significant gain change over the course of a measurement. Um, but this is a definite consideration. I also put LISO here. Uh, LISO is a uh, what is it, lutetium yttrium ortho silicate? 
orthosilicate. I think um, LISO is very commonly used for um, uh, positron emission tomography, uh, PET imaging. Uh, it is a very fast scintillator. It is very high density. Um, and it is fantastic for those applications. One of the other interesting uh, things about LISO is it's non-hygroscopic, uh, which is uh, relatively uncommon for uh, inorganic scintillators. But uh, within it, uh, lutetium-176 uh, gives off um, several gamma rays and several beta particles that contribute to an internal radioactivity of it. So when taking background with these uh, scintillators, you're not only taking background of what is physically in your environment, but you're also taking internal radioactivity background of those scintillators. So something to keep in mind that uh, as uh, the number of scintillators and types are being um, uh, generated and used to uh, consider is what I'm measuring internal radioactivity and how does that impact uh, my measurements. Last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, voltage optimization. So now that we have our uh, scintillator chosen, we have it wrapped, we have it coupled, how do we determine our applied voltage uh, for this? So one of the methods that can be used, let's say if you're using an organic scintillator where we can't easily obtain a photo peak, is to look at some kind of signal to noise ratio. So in this case, um, as I previously uh, showed with the Compton, we can take the Compton edge as a function of signal, as a function of light output uh, for our detectors. And we can look at the root mean square or standard deviation of our baseline for the pulses to acquire some idea of what is our inherent noise in the baseline uh, of our detection system. And here you can see we've plotted the Compton edge location as a function of voltage and then that average root mean square uh, as a function of voltage and in this case noise. And if we plot um, or if we take the ratio between these two, so our signal to noise, we can see that we can acquire a very nice optimization uh, for this purpose. And that our optimized point is right about uh, 28.2 volts in this case. Pardon me. And this is uh, for a silicon photomultiplier. Um, and these measurements are relatively simple, easy to do. All you need is a cesium-137 source and to adjust your voltage and to take uh, measurements. With it. Uh, now, let's say that you have a... Um, uh, inorganic scintillator that you'd like to do this with and you want to optimize it for uh, energy resolution. You can do something very similar. So something to uh, remember is energy resolution is defined as the full width at half max of a photo peak divided by the energy of that photo peak. And in this case, we're putting this in terms of percent. So multiplying that by 100. So here is that same cerium bromide spectra. And just for your reference, uh, this is about um, uh, I guess this was actually about 6.2% energy resolution in this case. Uh, so what we can do is determine this resolution as a function of applied voltage to our detector. And we can see here that for the most part, this optimizes relatively nicely at just about 950 volts. We can see that the 1000 volts place is off for this case. Um, and I show this uh, to give you an idea that these optimization processes are not always uh, perfectly clean and that uh, for this measurement in particular um, to determine if this was an off point or if something went wrong, uh, we would really need to rerun this again and determine some standard deviation for these to get a very well-defined curve. Uh, but the overall trend that we get a uh, poorer resolution down to better resolution and then poorer again as a function of voltage uh, holds that there is definitely an optimized voltage where we're getting the most gain for our system and that uh, relative to the amount of noise in our system. Now, both of these methods are if we want to um, focus on energy resolution and things of that nature. There is another consideration, and that consideration is dynamic range. So here I have a Kane V1730 digitizer. So generally, as we've discussed, we take our output pulses, uh, we digitize them, and then we post-process them. 
This digitizer specifically has two dynamic range settings such that we can acquire pulses up to a half a volt or up to two volts, depending on how we want to split and look at our data. So for instance here, um, our Compton Edge um, for, in this case, this is still being uh, measuring cesium-137, our Compton Edge is right just over 0.4 volts. Let's call that just about 0.5 volts in this case. That means that our total dynamic range since um, 0.5 volts thus corresponds to 478 keV, which is the backscatter uh, for um, cesium-137. So if we assume that uh, that's half a volt and we have a two volt dynamic range, that puts our maximum um, energy uh, looking at about 1.9 MeV. So this puts a uh, threshold or a maximum energy that we can actually acquire with this digitizer. Now let's say that we want to look at some higher energy gamma rays. Let's say we're looking at very specific capture reactions. Um, and we need to look at a gamma rays above three MeV in this case. Um, in that case, one thing that we could do uh, or attempt to do is to reduce the uh, gain in voltage on our system such that we are um, effectively increasing uh, that dynamic range. Uh, vice versa, if we're only interested in lower energy events, we can also um, adjust the gain up, uh, increase our applied voltage um, so that we're only looking at those uh, low energy events that we care about. In this case, we're not necessarily optimizing for um, resolution or anything of that nature, but this definitely has considerations for um, applications. And with that, um, this is very much non-encompassing. There are many other things and considerations um, when setting up your detector, uh, data throughput, pile up, uh, shielding considerations, uh, all kinds of things of that nature, temperature fluctuation. Um, but with that, I think these are some major points that um, are definitely need to be considered when looking and when setting up a detector system. So with that, I'll thank you all very much for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, first question from uh, Marcus, have integrating spheres been used uh, to collect scintillator light in nuclear applications? It would do away with the need for a reflector. Timing may be affected though. Um, honestly, I am not certain. Uh, and that is something I will definitely look into. That's a very good question. A uh, question from uh, Jake Carter. Thanks for presenting. How do you choose the threshold on the curve for the uh, signal to noise ratio calculation? Uh, very good question. Uh, in this case, um, so I assume you are referring to this applied voltage here, um, in which case uh, this was something we started off. So we know for uh, silicon photomultipliers, uh, the photo detection efficiency varies as a function of applied voltage that as you approach the uh, I believe it's close to four or five volts above the breakdown voltage of the silicon photomultiplier, you maximize uh, the photo detection efficiency. So theoretically at those voltages, you should get the most um, light collection as possible. So what we did is we started off in this case, several volts below that um, earlier slide, oh, sorry, earlier slide for SNR. Oh, um, uh, give me one moment, sorry. You choose the threshold. Are you referring to uh, this value here? Ah, so the Compton edge. So Compton edges, um, in this case, are uh, relatively tricky to actually pick off. So there are two methods that are used for this. The first method um, is to take the uh, derivative of this and figure out where that derivative uh, equals zero. Um, and you call that point the Compton edge uh, for these. Uh, that tends to, while it works well, it tends to be off significantly. And the method that we actually use for determining the Compton 
edge values is we uh, simulate an unbroadened spectrum, in which case an unbroadened spectrum will just give you a line where the Compton edge is and then give you some multiple scattering interactions after that. We take that unbroadened spectrum and broaden it to be able to, as such that it matches our measured spectra. We then uh, overlay those two and the interaction location between the Compton edge for the unbroadened case and the broadened case is our calibration point for the Compton edge. So for the detectors I've been showing on here that are bar shaped, that tends to be about 60% of this uh, height of the Compton edge. And for larger detectors, that goes up significantly, um, upwards of 80% for a uh, two inch uh, still bean crystal, for instance. Of course, uh, and if you're interested in that work, um, there is a former student, Mark Norsworthy, uh, Mark spelled with a K, um, who published um, a bunch of results on how to actually go about and figure out that calculation. Is the backscatter peak typically at 200 keV or does it change from measurement to the next? Uh, it's typically around 200 keV, but it is definitely uh, gamma ray dependent, um, which can be figured out based off of the uh, Compton scattering equation. Is room return part of backscatter? Can you elaborate on backscatter not caused by room return? So I differentiate in this case um, between backscatter and room return solely because um, generally speaking, backscatter is uh, referring to gamma ray interactions uh, with the environment that then come and scatter in our detector system versus room return generally refers to neutrons scattering in the environment and then scattering in our system. Um, that's the major uh, consideration between those. Both are caused um, by the room and by surrounding materials with the system. All right, if there are any more, oh, one more question. Uh, what about calibration? How do you do that? Ah, so in terms of, so for calibration, ah, so I assume your question is uh, referring to uh, calibration from, in this case, voltage to KEV or KEVE uh, and talking about nonlinearity effects, things of that nature. Um, uh, Stefano is going to be talking about that tomorrow. Uh, so you'll get much more on calibration and those types of things tomorrow with that. Uh, in terms of calibration for how to choose your uh, voltage, uh, this signal to noise ratio and plotting the energy resolution as a function of applied voltage um, both show uh, how to go about that. But he'll be talking about uh, how do you actually go through the conversions on um, tomorrow. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. If there are any more questions, I'll be happy to uh, stay for just a couple more minutes and address them. But thank you all very much for coming. Um, Jake, uh, I didn't get the choice for voltage dynamic range. So um, this is so this is um, something that's very specific to these types of digitizers that uh, there you can adjust it specifically for these types of digitizers. Um, some digitizers can do that. Some digitizers can't. Um, so for instance, if you are if your electronics only have uh, low amplitude pulses, let's say that the Compton edge for uh, cesium-137 is closer to like 0.1 volts. 
um, where you don't and you don't necessarily want the high dynamic range across your system. You don't look want to look at uh, very high interactions, uh, things of high energy interactions, things of that nature. You have the option in this case to set it so you have a maximum dynamic range of 0 0.5 volts. Why does that matter is because uh, the digitizer also has some bit range. In this case, it's a 14 bit digitizer, which means that it takes that dynamic range and breaks it up into uh, discrete uh, levels where it is broken up into two times 10, two raised to the 14th power number of levels. In that case, it's just about 16,000. So you can think of it as you're getting better resolution uh, for those uh, types of interactions by using the smaller dynamic range and only breaking it up into uh, 16,000 interactions versus using the larger dynamic range that you're only breaking up into 16,000 interactions. Um, that's what. Uh, that's why you would consider using or changing the dynamic range for these uh, digitizers. Uh, however, that is uh, not always the case, depending on what type of digitizer is being used. <laughs> 